We're standing at the entrance to Camp Chesterfield. Camp Chesterfield is in Anderson, Indiana, about 30 miles north of Indianapolis and about 75 miles south of where John Fetzer grew up. I'm here with Reverend Professor Todd Leonard, who is an authority in spiritualism as well as the official camp historian. John Fetzer visited Camp Chesterfield over 40 years from 1934 to 1974. He himself described his experience uh, through a couple of quotes. As you know, through the years, I've always been searching. In spite of all of my professional careers in other fields, I've always, as an avocation, been selecting new spiritual paths to go down. I've gone down one path right after another, trying to find out what makes the world tick. Going back to the question of, who am I? He further elaborated about Camp Chesterfield when he said, there was a medium that I had known that was one of those that I had confidence in the efficacy of which he had to say. This was in Camp Chesterfield, Indiana, in 1934. So here at the camp, through a couple of trusted mediums, John would talk to his parents, his ancestors, prominent people, as well as his guides. And then in the mid-60s through the 70s, he worked on genealogies, first with the Fetzer family, in one man's family, and then on, the, on his mother's side, through the men from Wingen. So Todd, could you please give us a brief history of Camp Chesterfield? In 1886, the idea of Camp Chesterfield actually came to fruition. Up until that point, Hoosier spiritualists had been going all the way to Michigan. There a, was a wonderful camp called Fraser Grove in Vicksburg, Michigan, and enough Hoosiers were going up there and running into each other that they decided we should have a, our own camp. Why not? So John Westerfield started the ball rolling, and he started, had a meeting in his office where he had a pharmacy in Anderson, and those initial spiritualists met and started what is today the Indiana Association of Spiritualists. And then after a few years of meeting in his office, they had a church picnic in what is now uh, Camp Chesterfield. And that year they decided this would be a perfect spot for our camp. This is sacred Indian grounds. Native Americans revered these grounds. The Adena Hopewell Indians, uh, ancient primitive group, were here. And because of that, the grounds were absolutely perfect for the natural beauty. And then uh, the next year, they incorporated, they bought Camp Chesterfield, the land from some of the founding members, and that's how the Camp Chesterfield started. The buildings came little by little, but very quickly actually, because there were enough people interested that the demand outgrew the space. So they built a boarding house, they built some medium cottages, they built cafeteria. They had an auditorium, and of course the shanties were the seance rooms and things. So Camp Chesterfield actually started in 1891 with the Indiana Association of Spiritualists starting in 1886 and then up until today Camp Chesterfield is still a thriving spiritualist camp and during its heyday we had 800 people sitting in the cathedral at one time so it was a very very popular and very very important aspect of Indiana religious history. Thank you. Bruce, we're now sitting in the center of the grounds in the grove area, and this is affectionately called the toadstools by all the residents and students here at Camp Chesterfield. These lovely tables and chairs were what we would probably consider to be the original psychic fair of what people are familiar with today. Mm. This was before people had their own cottages, but all the people would come and stand in line to have readings and the mediums would sit here and wait for a person to come to get their reading. Well that's fantastic and as we know John Fetzer frequented Camp Chesterfield 
he must have actually attended this as well. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he sat at some of these actual tables. So when John Pitzer was then asked later about his interest in Camp Chesterfield, he actually explained it in an interview, and so I want to read his own words about his experience. He came to Camp Chesterfield just out of innate curiosity. He'd heard about it. Everyone in Indiana had heard about it. It was probably in the mid-40s, but I'm not sure. Well, we know that to be 1934 now. Mm -hmm. When asked whether it was strange when someone appeared and spoke to him through medium, and whether he was afraid, he said, no. It was very exciting, of course, but I was never afraid. So my question to you then, Todd, is could you please explain spiritualism, mediums, and seances? Oh, absolutely. I have to agree with John. There's nothing scary. There's nothing to be afraid of. Our spirit friends come here to make contact because they love us and they want to be around us and to make that contact. Spiritualism started modern spiritualism, I should say, started in 1848 when the sisters Kate and Maggie Fox made contact with an incarnate spirit in their home mm -hmm. through raps. And at first it did scare them. In fact, they called the uh, spirit, when they didn't know its name, uh, Mr. Splitfoot, because that was a nickname for the devil, because they really didn't understand what was happening. Slowly, though, the movement began after people started to learn about the sisters' experience with this, and they were tested over and over, and that's how the movement of modern spiritualism actually began. Of course, spiritualism, the idea of spirit communication, goes back to time immemorial. It's throughout all of history, it's in the Bible, it, it's ancient. But the idea of making modern contact is the date of um, March 31st, 1848. Now, mediumship, a lot of times people think of mediums as psychics, mm -hmm. which is true to a certain extent, because I believe that all mediums are psychic, but not all psychics are mediums. Mm -hmm. And the difference is that in mediumship, we make contact with the other side. The continuity of life, spirit communication, is what sets spiritualism apart from any other religion. The idea that we can speak and communicate with those who've passed to the other side. The seance has been a very important part of spiritualism throughout our entire history. And the seance is a place where people can sit in a circle, commune together, and be able to make spirit contact through the gifts of the medium leading the seance. And we will have an opportunity to go into a seance room in a little bit, so you'll get to experience that today. I look forward to that. And we know, of course, from John's own words, that he came to Camp Chesterfield regularly in the 60s and 70s to help complete the work on his genealogies. And so he would have actually picked up the practice of speaking or communicating with ancestors or, you know, or, 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 or passed over loved ones. Absolutely, I'm sure. And so he would have actually engaged mediums uh, and as well as engaged in seances here. Sure. This is bu bucolic. Here we are in the valley surrounded by cottages, but it's sacred ground. It certainly is. So the informal setting here was all part of actually creating uh, the context mm -hmm. for spirit to show up. And you have to realize that so much was planned in each day. They would get up with a Vesper service where they would have some sort of church service where they would start the day maybe with a meditation. Then they would go on and have workshops or speakers. Then they would have the regular message services where people would attend and even a sermon service or a lecture. And then of course in the evening they would have seances where they would go to different mediums. Um, they would, the mediums actually traditionally had books outside their doors where you would sign up for a time. And if you didn't get there early, you didn't get a reading because so many people clamored to have readings by the mediums. And I'm sure he arranged everything before he came with the ones that he especially wanted to have readings with. But there was so much going on that their three days probably wasn't even enough. But that's all he could take out from his busy life up in Michigan to be able to come down here. So Todd, could you go into a little bit more detail about uh, the mediums and seances themselves? Oh, absolutely. Types of seances. Sure. The traditional seances are divided between mental mediumship and physical mediumship, usually. Mm -hmm. A mental uh, phys uh, 
mediumship basically is clairvoyance, which means clear seeing, clear seeing, uh, clear audience, clear hearing. There's even clear gustience, which is clear smelling. Sometimes spirit will come through with some sort of odor or aroma. A grand grandfather that smoked a cherry tobacco pipe, for instance, sometimes that will come in when you're having a seance and people will recognize that and say, oh, my grandfather's here, I can smell his pipe. Uh, clairsentience, also clear feeling. Sometimes you will feel the, a brush of air on the back of your neck or something and that will signal that spirit is around you. Physical mediumship means that physically a manifestation may occur. And in order for that to happen, the medium has to be very, very in tune, one. And the way that happens is that the ectoplasm is formed from the sitters and the medium, which will form the energy to make the manifestation. And that's much harder to do, but Camp Chesterfield had some wonderful physical mediums. And when John Fetzer came here, that was very typical. For instance, trumpet mediumship, also called direct voice, where a trumpet would be placed in the seance room and then the ectoplasm from the sitters and the medium would form a voice box within that trumpet and then a voice would have come out independent, separately from the actual medium. So those are the types. Today we have mostly mental mediumship as the type of mediumship that's done because of the dedication and the training that it takes to do that type of physical mediumship. It's very difficult. So tied in the mental mediumship, mm -hmm. who actually comes through? Is it ancestors, guides? or disincarnate higher beings, um, what, what's the range of entities that come through in, in, in these uh, practices? Well, certainly it depends upon the seance and the person receiving the message, but all that you just mentioned, uh, oftentimes loved ones from the family, and sometimes it can be recent loved ones, or it could be very, very far back, maybe someone that the person never knew, but that energy, that connection is still there. So people will be able to connect with them, and the medium will sometimes bring them through. The medium usually works with five guides, the master teacher guide, the doctor teacher, the protector guide, which is usually a Native American entity, the chemist, and then the joy guide. The joy guide is usually portrays himself or comes through as a child and often is very fun-loving and um, joyful, and that's why they're called the joy guide. So the medium will use one of the guides as a gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper will line up the spirit people, and whether that's family, whether that's ancestors, whether that's uh, higher beings, as you say, and allow them in so the medium will be able to give the message to the actual sitter or the person in the seance. So just to answer your question, it is a combination of all those that can come through. Um, that's very typical. Are these guides of the medium or of the individual as in the site? Both. Both. The guide of the medium usually is there just to facilitate. Okay. There's no reason for them to actually give a message necessarily, but they're there to accommodate, to assist, to facilitate the medium in bringing in the people that actually need to speak to the person who's receiving the message. So the people that come through is very personal to the people that is actually are actually sitting there receiving the messages in the seance setting. How about ascended masters? So for example, Jesus or Archangel Michael or Saint Germain. So could you give us uh, some examples of ascended masters and, and, and conditions under which those might present? Sure. Um, in fact, we have had ascended masters seances here mm -hmm. where the ascended masters would be brought through. We know that John Fetzer actually integrated this belief in disincarnate entities, uh, so, so forth, the idea of spiritualism, but he integrated this into his, his belief going forward. How much of an impact would Camp Chesterfield made on John Fetzer for him to integrate this as part of his permanent spiritual uh, framework? I think tremendously. I think that 
Camp Chesterfield probably had a tremendous impact on his way of viewing things. And since he came back over and over and over for a period of 40 years, it just is testament in itself how much he valued the information, the learning, the type of classes that he probably took here, and of course the personal readings and messages that he would receive. But definitely I think that Camp Chesterfield played a huge part in what he believed and it probably opened his eyes to a idea of believing a lot of different ideas for instance reincarnation i'm sure that's not something he learned as a child growing up in his home church right. and that was something that he would have learned here and um, spiritualism traditionally negated reincarnation for many many years but as theosophy became very popular as um, not a substitute but an additional type of belief system people began to understand how reincarnation could be a very very important aspect of one's own personal spirituality and spiritual development um, we're all souls in learning we all have to experience all the life dramas and all the different tribulations and joys that are here on earth so most certainly i think that reincarnation uh, is a good answer to how we do grow on a soul level. So I'm sure he believed that very strongly. John Fetzer lost his father at the age of two and his younger brother Walter shortly thereafter. Then later in 1958 when his mother Della passed on, he started communicating with both his mother and father through mediums at Camp Chesterfield and Ina Twig in London. Concurrently, he was communicating with his mother, father, and Walter through Lillian D. Johnson's spirit cards. Mm -hmm. And then in the 60s, he started his genealogies on Fetzer and Winger, in which situation he engaged uh, the assistance of Lillian D. Johnson and Charlie Swan through spirit photography. At the same time in the 60s, John Fetzer became immersed in the New Age. And of course, the New Age includes concepts such as karma, reincarnation, and the Aquarian conspiracy, or the dawning of a spiritual millennium. Mm -hmm. But despite all this, you describe John Fetzer as a nominal spiritualist, someone that regularly attends, attended the camp and frequently uh, engaged the services of mediums. So could you please explain the convergence and divergence of the New Age and spiritualism. It's interesting that you would use New Age because uh, many of the older spiritualists consider us to be old age, that we're not part of that New Age, that our religion is much more um, settled than being some of the New Age belief systems that tend to be very trendy. So even though oftentimes people put us in the New Age category, a lot of uh, spiritualists would say, oh no, we're old age. Mm. And to prove that, it's very interesting because spiritualism always had this influx of interest after a major war. And of course, the first being the Civil War. Um, many families were touched by that. Same with World War I and then World War II and even the Vietnam War. So after each of these major wars, people really sought out because they needed that closure. They needed to have that connection. They needed to, to know their loved ones was, were okay. Mm -hmm. And that's what spiritualism offers to people, that idea of being able to um, know that their loved ones are in a good place, they're happy, they're content. So that closure, that idea of the continuity of life is the main purpose of spiritualism and why spiritualism has endured. So I think that the idea of this divergence of people seeking out spiritualism throughout the past um, hundred years is a testament to the idea that spiritualism offers people some type of connection to the loved ones that they wouldn't get any other way. And I think that that's probably why John Fetzer initially searched out his um, mediumship or the connection to mediumship and to spiritualism because he was also searching for that type of closure to know about his family. Bruce, we're now in the Western Hotel, which was built in the mid-1940s, and it was the, one of the first brick 
hotels built in this area and it's in the style of their old roadie style mm. and it's what really pushed Camp Chesterfield to get on the National Register of Historic Places. Mm. Most likely John Fetzer stayed in either the Lily or the Sunflower up until the time this hotel was built because this hotel offered private restrooms, bathrooms in each room and it was much more modern. And we have evidence that he did stay here multiple times during the 1960s and 70s because in our archives we have the registers. I'd like to show you one. That's fabulous. And this one, dated August 14th, 1962, can you find his name? I see John E. Fetzer, Kalamazoo, Michigan, $10. Yes, and he stayed in room 120. So this is a wonderful aspect of our archives that allowed us to go through and find where he stayed and we found multiple times uh, that he did stay here. Todd, this is amazing because John E. Fetzer, John Fetzer would have traveled under an alias. He would travel anonymously, especially when he went to things that were not as mainstream. So why do you suppose that John would have been so comfortable as to sign in with his own name here? I think after coming here for decades, I think that he had a comfort level. This became a second home to him. Mm. And oftentimes we'll say to students when they leave, we'll leave the light on for you. Because this place does have a way of getting uh, into your soul because of the sacred grounds and the people. He just felt very comfortable with them and I don't think he felt threatened at all. And they, he knew that they had his best interest at heart. So I think he felt comfortable. Just that he one would of just, the spiritual family. Exactly, one of the spiritual family members. So I have a feeling that he felt very comfortable when he came here and there was absolutely no uh, problem with him signing his own name. Well, thank you for showing that to oh, us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy that we had this for you to see. I'm in the Het Art Gallery and Museum in the West Gallery, and behind me are photographs taken around the time that John Fetzer would have been coming to Camp Chesterfield. The photographs behind me include the picture of the auditorium that he most likely attended services in before the cathedral was built, the fountain, the grotto, and also the Trail of Religions, which he was very fond of. The camp weekend that was very typical from the time that he started coming in 1934 through 1974 changed greatly over the years. In 1934, it was a much shorter season. For instance, it went from July 14th to August 26th. It included activities such as classes, sermons, message services, uh, some workshops, and of course attending seances and going to readings with individual mediums. In 1974, the program was much more, um, had a, many more activities included, and it went from June 28th to August 25th, and it included special guest speakers that would oftentimes be invited. So Camp Chesterfield did attract a lot of very influential people in the spiritual areas of spiritualism and outside of spiritualism from the very beginning up until today. But John Fetzer would have been able to enjoy some of these wonderful presentations that these people gave and of course attend seance, attend uh, classes, and of course meet with his mediums for private readings. Bruce, this is the Head Art Gallery and Museum at Historic Camp Chesterfield. This particular room is the Art Gallery West, and the exhibits in this room include apports, spirit art, spirit phenomena, and the history of spiritualism. Many mediums, very wonderful and amazing mediums who are part of Camp Chesterfield's history are featured in this room. It wouldn't surprise me if John Fetzer had some of these mediums give him readings during his many visits here. Yes, Todd, we've actually seen work of two of John's favorite mediums, Charlie Swan and Lillian D. Johnson, whose mediumistic talents helped him extensively in the genealogies he was preparing. Years later, he told me, and also Tom Beaver recalls, that when he was working on the genealogies and got stuck, 
that he could come down to Champ Camp Chesterfield and trusted mediums would bring forward either an ancestor or ancestors that would give him a clue or point him to a cemetery upon which when he visited those cemeteries, completed a missing piece of the puzzle. That's amazing confirmation. That he actually featured him in his first genealogy, one man's family of the Fetzer genealogy. And you can see on page 11 of the acknowledgments here that he actually specifically pointed out Mrs. Lillian Johnson of Bradenton, Florida, and Mr. Charles Swan of Anderson, Indiana, for lending their good offices and securing the drawing and picture of Johanna Bunce Fetzer. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and I look forward to seeing some of their work. Oh, wonderful. Bruce, here's an example of a card done by Lillian D. Johnson that we have here in the West Gallery. And this is very typical of the type of work she did. Wow. This is Charles Johnson, whose given name is Lillian D. Johnson, actually precipitated spirit cards for John Fetzer. Spirit cards are messages from ancestors that also sometimes include uh, sketches or pictures. And so in the summer of 1964, Lillian D. Johnson precipitated a spirit card for John Fetzer of one of his ancestors, Johanna Bunce Fetzer. Here's a copy of that spirit card that was precipitated. I can see the style. It's very much like Lillian D. Johnson of the things we have here in our museum. And so here's the message that came through on this. This is as nearly as I can think as to how I looked when I was a young girl. Later in life, I put on weight but I love to wear my hair in these curls. This is the way I like to think I looked. Oh, how nice. Now, do you know how these cards were actually made? Could you describe that? Sure. Basically, most mediums would have a very tightly woven basket that had a very tight lid. They'd put um, the blank cards with the colored pencils in the basket, and then they would close it and then oftentimes they'll do some type of message work, sit in meditation with the sitters, whoever the cards are for, because it's usually in a seance-like situation. And then after a certain amount of time, where they say after it cooks a while, then they'll open up the basket and then the cards will be there and they'll pass the cards out to the actual sitters. So that's, that's how John got his card. That's fantastic. And what a touching message. It is, it is. They're always very sweet and very heartfelt and very confirming off, oftentimes as well. Bruce, this is an example of one of Lillian D. Johnson's cards, and I understand you have some more cards that were done for John Fetzer? Absolutely. Lillian D. Johnson also produced and, and, and precipitated spirit cards for John's, two of John's guides, his master teacher as well as his joy guide. So I'll read the inscription for the master teacher spirit card says, my son, remember this little couplet. He who comes to God an inch through doubting dim, in blazing light, God will advance a mile to him, your teacher. And then his joy guide had a message. I thought we had the port I thought that while we had the portrait painter around, I'd ask him to do me too. But this picture makes me look like a baby, and I'm not a baby. <laughs> I'm a grown-up enough to help you a whole lot, and I do too. That sounds like something a joy guide would say, doesn't it? Yeah, Very absolutely. childlike.
Bruce. This is an example of some of the spirit photography that Charlie Swan did that we have displayed here in the West Gallery. Medium Charlie Swan precipitated a number of spirit photos for John's genealogies that he used in both books. In that same summer of 1964, he also made a, a photograph of Johanna Bunz Fetzer. Look at this. And you can see that John was actually so impressed with the rendition of the spirit photo that he featured Johanna Bunz Fetzer in the cover page of his genealogy from one man's family. Amazing. And so then John actually later explained how spirit photography worked. And so in his own words, what John said is, is that I received photographs that were obtained at Camp Chesterfield psychically. This medium would get people in a circle so they would stand around and hold photographic paper against their solar plexus. And after you'd go through the exercise, you'd get a picture. So I obtained these pictures this way, and when they came through, I was told who they were. That's why they're in there. You have to remember, these pictures would be from the 16th century, long before ph photography. Yet, these were all obtained through mediumship. So could you tell us more about how Charlie Swan would have precipitated spirit photos? I'd be happy to. One thing that he did was he would actually have an unopened package of photographic paper and he would open it in front of the sitters and then he would take out one randomly and they would actually put it in the chemicals and it would show there was no, there was no image on it. It would come out black. And then he'd give a card to each person and as John Fetzer described, they would hold it on their solar plexus and oftentimes they would say the Lord's Prayer or do some type of sound vibration to raise that energy in the room and then they would do some breathing exercises and then after a while Charlie would come and place his hand over the paper over the hand of the sitter and it's been described like he would have some type of a electric shock go through him after about 10 seconds and then he would go off to the next person. And then when he was finished doing that, then they would each put their paper in the chemicals and then they would be amazed at the images that would come through. That's Amazing process, isn't that's it? That's fantastic. Yes. So Todd, I wanna mm -hmm. show you two more spirit photos from medium Charlie Swan. This is of, of uh, men from Wingen, Christian Winger and his wife, Barbara Winger. John was impressed with the photos that were actually precipitated by Charlie Swan, and he featured Christian on page 77 in his genealogy, Men from Wingen, and Barbara, his wife, was on page 80 in the Men from Wingen. Amazing renditions. Absolutely, and John actually had a, a talented artist friend of theirs take the spirit photos and render sketches from these. Wonderful, wonderful work. John Fetzer, later described the process. And so in his own words, for the most part, most everyone in there got pictures of loved ones they could recognize of people already on the other side. But I was asking for pictures that were long since gone and I went in and asked for a picture of Christian Winger and this is what I got. And when I asked for his wife, I got this one. So Christian and his wife, Barbara. That's amazing. That is very amazing. And I'm looking at the actual spirit photography and it's just an amazing array of people in each of the photographs. And the fact that he was able to pull two of those out that were actually relatives and have those renditions done is nothing short of astounding. So Todd, thank you very much for showing us this museum. Oh, it's my pleasure. And do you realize that this is the largest collection of spiritual artifacts anywhere in the world for spiritualism? Bruce, this is the Tree of Life Books and Gifts. Although it's not the same as when John Fetzer was here, it's the same building. It's of course been remodeled. But this is probably where he would have purchased some of his materials that he used for his spiritual studies. Absolutely. You know, John Fetzer read extensively about mysticism as well as spirituality. 
In fact, when he was asked about where he got his reference material, uh, he explained as follows, and I'll read a quote from him. Okay. He said, he read on everything he could get his hands on. Camp Chesterfield had a bookshop. I think that over time I went down there, I would buy three or four books at a time. So he extensively used this bookshop in his own words. Mm -hmm. And he also extensively read about uh, Alice Bailey and theosophy. Mm. So could you just briefly explain uh, over the time that John w was coming to Camp Chesterfield, what types of books might have been in the bookstore? Oh, absolutely. The books you mentioned, Theosophy, Alice Bailey, of course, those are huge titles that would have been here, along with all kinds of books on the esoteric studies, metaphysical studies, as well as spiritualism. And I'm sure he didn't have any other opportunity to find these types of materials, because bookstores of this type were very few and far between, even today. But during the time that John was coming here, this was one of the best resources. And this bookstore has been here for a long time, and it will continue to be, because it does focus on those types of uh, titles and those types of areas. So I get the image of Camp Chesterfield being the University of Spirit and the bookstore being his reference library. I like that image, actually. That's a very good way to explain it because we are an education-based camp. Todd, you brought us here to the Trail of Religions at Camp mm -hmm. Chesterfield. This reminds me of a place in the John E. Fetzer Institute called the Hall of Records. It was removed subsequent to John Fetzer's passing, but was prescribed by him as part of the original building. John Fetzer believed in reincarnation and believed that he had actually lived the lives in the Hall of Records. And so, Todd, let me show you a picture of the Hall of Records uh, that was in the original uh, John E. Fetzer Institute. So, there were eight busts arranged in a semicircle, very similar to the Trail of Religions here. And uh, it was fashioned after a dome in Monticello. But from left to right, the bust included Socrates, Ramses II of Egypt, Francis I of France, Joseph of Arimathea, Louis XIV of France, St. John of the Cross, Henry II of England, and Thomas Jefferson. So Todd, tell us about the figures in the Trail of Religions and their significance. I'd be happy to. This display is very unique for any place around the world. I doubt whether there's anything similar exactly like it. In the center, we have Osiris, who represents the ancient civilization and religion of Egypt and the River Nile. On his robe are hieroglyphics, the circle meaning the sun and the crab representing sun worship. To the right, around the wall, are the bust of Zoroaster, the founder of the Magi, then we have Abraham, who is the Hebrew patriarch, then Muhammad, the almighty Arab, and then Zeus, the king of the Greek gods. To the left of Osiris, we have Lao Tzu, and on his hat are the words to understand and to proclaim. Next to Osiris, we have the great Buddha, who represents the Buddha religion, and then the Chinese philosopher Confucius, also wearing the Chinese uh, inscription that Lao Tzu has on his mm -hmm. hat. And finally, we have Vardamana, the founder of Jainism, and that completes the semicircle. The great religious founders that are represented here in history are gathered in one large ark, very similar to the Hall of Records that John Fetzer had put at the Institute. But each of these have their arms imprisoned in the rough natural stone, and each has his eyes toward, turned towards the center, towards the bust of Jesus Christ, free and unfettered, mm. and his head thrown back with his eyes looking upward towards the creator of all. Thank you very much. That's inspirational. It is. It is. And I'm sure that was very inspirational for John Fetzer and the reason why he chose to put his bust in a similar configuration.
Well, it gives me great pleasure. We're now in an actual seance room, which is the longest continually used seance room on the grounds. Is that correct? That this is, is correct. Reverend Juana Irvin who is a longtime resident medium here at Camp mm -hmm. Chesterfield, and she's also on the Board of Trustees for the Indiana Association of Spiritualists, That's a very important person here. <laughs> Can you give correct. us a little bit of the history of this room? Uh, well, uh, in, in uh, the workings of it, approximately 100 years of uh, continuous service uh, from this room uh, in uh, seances, uh, education, healing, mediumship, uh, uh, and so it is the longest operating room continuous uh, on Camp Chesterfield. That's amazing. Now, do you have any special objects here that you'd like to tell us about? Oh, I'm going to share with you a little bit about uh, my grandfather, uh, my mother's strong mentor in this work. Uh, George Washington Freeman uh, was medium, uh, but a theosophist, oh. uh, and he studied uh, religion uh, on many, many different levels and many different religious ideas. Uh, and so was very strong in her upbringing of that ability mm. uh, to be able to cherish, understand, and respect all walks of religious freedom, uh, not just uh, Christianity, uh, although that's our that's certainly our strong foundation, mm -hmm. uh, but of much deeper understanding of spirituality. Oh. Now uh, the trumpets you have here. Yes, can you explain a little uh, bit? About I, I'd be happy to. Uh, I have three trumpets here. Uh, these two uh, are my mother's trumpets that she used uh, in uh, seance. Three trumpets were given to her uh, kind of through that apostolic uh, tradition. You didn't buy a new trumpet when you became You inherited a, uh, one. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, that you were given. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one belonged to Mabel Riffle, uh, one was um, Clifford Bias's and one uh, belonged to Charlie Swan. Oh my goodness, and, Charlie uh, Swan, which is an important name for John Fetzer, because oh, that's who John he, Fetzer most definitely. came to most, visit often, yes, along with yes, Lillian D. Johnson. Yes. Can you explain that a little bit, a bit, the difference between mental mediumship and physical mediumship and the type of uh, physical mediumship that your mother did in this room? My mother was a physical medium, mm -hmm. uh, and sh which uh, we say trumpet or direct voice. Mm -hmm. uh, apports were gifts from spirit, uh, and she did card writing, apports, materialization, uh, just as uh, Mabel and, and Clifford and Charlie, our mm -hmm. beloved Charlie Swan, mm -hmm. uh, a very uh, gifted medium. Uh, the difference is, uh, in order to produce in physical phenomena, materialization, apports, uh, you must be able to produce ectoplasm, and that is a chemical uh, within the body of the medium. Many used to say you had to be born with that, uh, but it has been proven <laughs> that uh, through uh, dedication, due diligence, uh, studying. You can with, develop that as well. Developing mm -hmm. with a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, a physical phenomena teacher, uh, that it has been developed. Can you talk a little bit about how you do seances in this room and the type of seances? And then would you give us a little demonstration? I would be happy to. Thank you. Uh, I am a mental medium, uh, continuously working toward becoming a physical medium. Uh, so what I do here is trance seance in the red light, uh, and that is mental mediumship. Uh, I'm not going, there will be no materialization mm -hmm. produced, <laughs> but uh, certainly direct speaking uh, with your loved ones. Uh, in and you go into trance, which yes, I do. the viewers may not really understand what that, that is. is. Can correct. you explain a little uh, bit about that? Well, uh, um, it's altered state of consciousness, mm -hmm. and so uh, you're in the lower levels of uh, uh, theta mm -hmm. uh, for transmediumship. The further you go into theta, mm -hmm. 
Then uh, my mother was dead trance medium, as was Clifford, Mabel, and Charlie. Uh, and dead trance is in that furthest reaches of, of the consciousness. Theta yes. going into delta as right. in dead trance. Mm -hmm. And so mine is a lighter trance. I'm aware uh, as of I the work. things going on yes. around you. Yes. Uh, I may not remember everything, but I am mm -hmm. aware mm -hmm. where uh, as the other, the physical phenomena mediums work, they were in dead trance and not mm -hmm. aware of of anything that went on. Yes. I think maybe if you would sit in your chair and give us a little demonstration, would that well, be okay? Normally, that would be shutting up uh, this room, turning off door the lights, shut, turning the lights off, sealing it, dark for a moment. Yes, mm -hmm. sealing everything up uh, and dark for just a moment, and then the red light comes on. Everyone take a nice, deep breath. And I will turn the light on. And this immediately will turn this over uh, to my wonderful Dr. Philip Rayburn, uh, will introduce himself. A very wonderful good morning to you all here this morning. Uh, I know and understand uh, that this is a very auspicious occasion uh, for the room, for the mediums present, uh, and for the wonderful Fetzer Foundation. And so uh, it is a great privilege and honor uh, that I share w this space this morning uh, with all of you. Uh, it is, uh, well, to tell you now, it is uh, oh, John Fetzer has opened a wonderful opportunity uh, for many uh, who knew him well uh, to be able to share in some of the most fondest things that were in his heart that helped him help others throughout his life. And so it is my privilege to be an instrument and a, a, a very a particular uh, helpful part of this program. I send uh, uh, kindness and love to all of you uh, from this uh, wonderful benefactor. <laughs> uh, uh, it is this most special opportunity. And know that John is right here with us, <laughs> orchestrating in his own way, as you would understand. Uh, blessings to all of you, and uh, it is my deepest desire uh, that this uh, will uh, work abundantly uh, for all of you. And I thank you all uh, for being here uh, and uh, for your interest uh, in uh, John's most important part uh, of his life. And I will say a good evening to you now. 